down in Dendera where the famous Zodiac is, the house of gold isn't made of gold, but stuff colored gold. And as you know, like there are all these processes for like taking a, a copper lead alloy and making it look silver or making it look gold, but nobody's saying it is gold. The idea is for you to become gold like Ra, the sun, and, and merge with that divine consciousness, which then gets overlaid directly into a Christ consciousness, or, um, which I know even saying that sounds like a new agey term, but yeah. that's exactly what's going on there. And it's it's really fascinating. So what I like to think of with decopying that Codex Marcianus is, first of all, like, Guy had to be seriously motivated to copy a whole text in ancient Greek, even though he was an ancient Greek scholar. But then can you imagine, like, even to someone like D, this is mind-blowing stuff. I mean, it's it's well, crazy stuff. Isis talking to angels uh, yeah. creating Christ or Osiris as her husband, but by re putting mm -hmm. the it, it, so much is going yeah. on with that. And I, again, I don't I don't want you to necessarily to to uh, to explain it at all in any way to the audience here listening to this oh, later oh, on, because good. you've already done this. And I want <laughs> to encourage people to to go through the entire course that you've created, as most of my oh, friends okay. currently oh. are, if they want to stay my friends for long. Oh, <laughs> So but, there's but, a whole, but we're just discover, discovering this stuff. But like apparently, that text, uh, Marie von Franz, a student of Young, was way into that Isis, the prophetess of Horus text. And to go back to my friend Vincent, he was the one that he kept writing about it to the point that I was snarky. And I, you know, Vincent's dead now. So if he's listening, sorry about this, Vincent. But at one point, he kept referring to this text, but he had no good translation and his footnotes were horrible. And, you know, and I was a professor then and I was writing stuff with him. And he was cited on some freshman composition site in the US as like an example of poor citation or something like that. Oh my God. And I'm like, see, you can't do this anymore. That's and then, then I realized like how hard it is to, to know what's going on in there. I mean, it's, they're not, most of it's still not translated into English. So. Of the I'll, codex? Yeah. Oh yeah. Wow. Most of it, it's translated. It's, there's a lot more of it translated into French. There's a little of it translated into German. Um, the one that's translated the most is um, that the vision of Zosimus or on excellence on virtue, but like the, the one that I find of Zosimus, the most fascinating on the letter Omega where. Yeah. Like Adam is made of four elements and Jesus comes and visits Adam and helps him not be enslaved by the elements. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a, it, it sounds exactly like what every Golden Dawn adept has been wishing we could find as a source for all of Mathers and Westcott's uh, creativity, shall we say? Yeah. But then where did they get that from? I mean, so I'll tell you one per a person who like historically, I don't even know what I think about this person, Arthur Edward Waite. I mean, he's a fascinating character. But when he is trying to explain the Turbo Philosophorum, which is not near as interesting anyway, but he's trying to explain this nature rejoices in nature, which, uh, quote, well, so somehow Wait knows to go to the Codex Marcianus because then he's yeah. explaining this. And, and, and I remember reading that and going like, how did he know to look at this? I mean, and uh, Westcott must have yeah. talked about it. Something. Oh, I mean, I don't like, know. Did could Westcott read Greek? I don't. I don't know. Somebody knew something about it. And now that I think of it, that is that was in Westcott's era. That was. I mean, you know, Latin, and if you were a good student, you'd you'd study Greek. I think that's it's. It, so I guess, of course, he would have known Greek. So, sorry, Westcott. Anyway, during the the tour yeah. of the Alchemist Museum with my friend, I noticed mm -hmm. that there's the astronomical tower, right, with right. The shaped windows, mm -hmm. um, and there was a stairwell going up to it. And it was it was um, it was unlocked. And I asked the tour guide if I could go up there. And she says, I've never seen that unlocked before. It's always been locked. I don't even know of any of anyone who goes up there. But if it's unlocked, you, of course, you can go up. And I thought, this is far out. OK, oh, wow. so I grabbed my I thought, well, what if I go do like, you know, the 10th call of text up there and, and <laughs> see what happens. And I'll, I'll bring I'll film it on my iPad. And you can see that video on my yeah. YouTube. Um, not many people watched it or, or care, which is fine. But halfway through the call, I had I, uh, I had got a jolt, and it was yeah. like you don't need that here. And I stumble. You can see it when it happens in the call because I stumble over the words. And this is probably one of the 
the the things I know best in life. If there's anything I know very well, it's it's the the Ols Olsenuth, you know, um, call. Um, and 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 there, I I yeah, I had an experience. I looked out and meaning, I saw meaning, like, okay, if I could, meaning like you don't need to open the veil. If yeah, you there. yeah. And I looked out and it yeah, just was like yeah. disembodied auras stretching <laughs> across the rooftops. And this one yeah. spirit said, telling me its name and saying, um, you can talk to us without, without doing that here. Um, what are you here to do? And I said, well, I don't know. I'd like to do this. And they said, we can make that happen. And everything just fell into place. I went back up to Leipzig the next day to finish oh, wow. some work I was doing up there and then set up for two, the next 10 days, set up these lectures in Prague. I, I was going to do them down in, in Vienna, my old stomping ground, and also hit up the Thoth Hermes podcast at the same time. But coincidentally, he got sick. The Thoth yeah. Rudolph got oh. sick and Nick Farrell canceled our, our, coffee in rome so i didn't i just stayed in prague and yeah. did this series of lectures and tons of magical things happened throughout so you the were lectures. supposed to be there i mean it's it's, a, it's weird how many people the people who have the most magical experiences in there i'm convinced are people who just randomly wind up there and i mean i could list off stories but i figured vincent wound up there when he was in prague by zach um just uh, Vincent was giving his talk about Kelly's Tower and doing tour guide kind of things, which was something he was able to pull off. And I don't know how, as an American in Prague, he was able to pull that off, but he was really good at it. And then um, Zach came out and was like, you need to move in here. And he was like, oh, I didn't, there was, it. so he did. But all, all kinds of, uh, I got lost in Prague um, once when I was, I was staying with a former girlfriend of Vincent's who was there and she was working. And so I went to, and I got really sick wandering around in Malastrana and I'm like, God, I got to go somewhere and sit down. So I wound up sitting in the courtyard there all afternoon. And when I got there, I mean, I knew where I was. I was like, Oh, this is weird. Okay. I know where I'm at. I don't, I don't know how I got here. And I was calling, um, my friend and saying, I got Rodka, I'm in Kelly's tower. I don't know how I got here. Can you come get me? <laughs> <laughs> it was it was, was kind of wild anyway um yeah stuff opens there so another person we knew there kept i i said i was going to tell you the story of vincent's enochian lamp well since he was doing lots of enochian stuff there and you would have to have met him he was he's now I really believe he had some of Kelly's memories. He's one of several people I have known who thought they were the reincarnation of Kelly. But I mean, I don't really think we have a very clear metaphysics of how we understand past lives in the West. I mean, to me, that's not a problem at all. But I mean, we'd walk, he'd do like he'd run into a wall and be like, oh, that wall didn't used to be there. He'd know exactly the place to go, even though he never learned Czech. Uh, and I mean, it, it was uncanny. So, so he's working on Enochian stuff in Kelly's tower and one person there kept, so the story goes, you, anyone who wants to who is invited not to believe this, this person kept getting possessed by the ghost of Edward Dyer. Well, that was weird enough, but so that was the point of the whole uh, Enochian lamp was to set up a structure that, I mean, since you're supposed to do it in a Tiferetic space, but also once you get, get that going, so the ghosts that say weren't welcome stayed out for a time with these Enochian lamps, which is kind of a, I don't know, kind of a fun thing. Then have you heard of the story of the play that he put on there or did not put on as it turned out? No, I didn't. But I also can tell you, I am definitely going to be making an Enochian lamp. I don't know what it will be look like, but <laughs> that is happening for sure. <laughs> it, it, it was it was a, a pretty cool thing. So so Vincent wrote a play about the end of Kelly's life and involving Kelly's dark lady, and this was all drawn from a combat well it was drawn from a combination of historical and non-historical sources but his it's uh this was supposed to be put on in kelly's tower and at that time um when this was happening i was teaching in china where i'm going again in a week but alan was back um in the u.s so they were putting this play on i'd seen copies of it and and so on and they had a pretty good cast and everything but one person Vincent was doing magic with, they were also trying to make what they called a time telephone. There was something where Vincent wanted to go back and change something Kelly had done or something like this. It's a, a long a long story and would require, what, 
more explanation than I feel comfortable giving, frankly. So, so he called Alan, who was in Wisconsin in the United States, and they talked. And Vincent was like, "Hey, you got to come over here, you know, leave Uncle Sugar, da 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 da." And I, I mean, we've been over there to see him several times. But they had a great conversation, and then suddenly Vincent got tired and was like, "I got to go." Well, he sometime between then and the next morning died. The play was canceled. And so then, and of course, Kelly's ghost figured prominently about them. The story went from some of the people in the play that Edward Kelly's ghost was already upset by the play because in the play, Kelly forgives this woman and Kelly hadn't something like, I mean, it's sometime the, the play will be published somewhere and anyone interested can read it. But so then, and I swear, this is true. By the time that I was back, um, the year after Vincent died, 2015, you had to have a whole metaphysics, not just of past lives, but of ghosts. There's like, well, there's the ghost of Kelly who is pissed off about the play. There is the ghost of Kelly after Vincent died, who is guilty that he helped cause Vincent's death. And then there is some other Kelly that no one ghosts that no one can figures out and it's just like wow i have never experienced anything like this in my life before but but kelly's ghost was you know not uh affected by the enochian lamp it seems it only kept dire away and people like that then there were other stories about like they had an idea that that had been before d and kelly were there a um some kind of orphanage because there were all these child ghosts at one time that were kind of alarming. And then there was supposedly a Westonia ghost who was supposedly like running around and like a kid or something. But I, I mainly got there and encountered the Kelly ghost and, and that was interesting. And then I encountered the Kelly ghost when we went to most and made a promise which I haven't kept. And instead for years, I thought, why did I make a promise to a ghost of Edward <laughs> Kelly? Like, what was I thinking? Anyway, so quick spiel of, 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 of the ghost stories there. I love it. I love it. I'm sure the, the listeners will too. The, I haven't read Jenny and Donald Tyson's new book, uh, Spiritual Alchemy, which is all their scryings with Edward yeah. Kelly's ghost. Have you looked at that yet? Because I'd, I'd be more interested yeah. in hearing someone like your opinion than mine, because you know more details about his life than me. So you might actually catch things that he's like, oh, holy crap. Well, I, I don't know what. So what I thought isn't provable in any way at all. Uh, so I don't. But I thought this doesn't sound like Edward Kelly. In fact, I thought it sounded like Vincent. I mean, the person's talking in pretty clear American English, which but I mean, that can happen with 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 scrying. I know at some point Tyson and uh, Vincent uh, knew each other. I don't know um, in, in what way I, I like the book. I just I was. I was kind of taken by the kind the English he spoke. Um, yeah, and there were um, theories yeah. on how the, in, I mean, consciousness communication has yeah. got to be a weird thing, right? Um, but, well, there uh, is, although like, I mean, the Edward Kelly ghost I encountered swore at people in Latin. He didn't really like to speak English, so. Yeah, well, there's yeah. ghosts and then there's ghosts, perhaps. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, mean, I, st I still, I still tell people I don't believe in reincarnation, but really, I just don't believe in the simplified leapfrogging version that we have, exactly. or, or the 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 I, you know the forms of karma used to keep people in their places in life, their stations that right. they're born into, all that stuff. I think we need to, people need people. I don't mind talking about these big ideas; it's great. But it, pe I think people do need to think about them a little bit more before they. Well, that's it. If you're thinking of basically like take just a few modern scientific ideas, think of the body as energy. Well, energy splits apart; it comes together. I mean, yeah, it's exactly it's that leapfrogging thing that just gets on my nerves. It's like I realized in the last in my last life, I then of course. Someone is always someone famous anyway, but there is not ever the notion that this energy body that was this consciousness could have split into multiple consciousnesses or that they could like drop in at a particular time. I mean, I had a friend who uh, was certain at a certain time in her life that it seemed like she knew all kinds of things that she'd never learned before. And I mean, who knows what happened, but she was open to the idea of, well, maybe some other consciousness just dropped in and merged with mine. I mean, we don't, one of the things we don't talk very much about is the whole structure of consciousness. And that's like the most beautiful thing about humanity, I think, seriously, like 
Well, yeah. if you talk about fusing with divine consciousness, okay, great. Well, and and human consciousness break apart and come together. And anyhow, conversation for another it's, time. It's it's the the in your course the fact that like as I started to realize going through the the videos that what you were actually going to demonstrate is a is a complete line of transmission from the explicitly spiritual alchemy of Zosimos, though God knows, uh, before I, I'm reading Grimes' book, uh, mm -hmm. right after I have it, I'm reading yeah. it right after I study glass making for the next few weeks. I need oh, to, wow. I need to study <laughs> glass making in the form of, um, uh, it's not Chumbly, what's his name, Churton's new book on the yeah. early alchemists. So I'm reading oh, that, wow. and he, and it's mostly about glass making, a lot yeah. about glass making and dyes. But I'm yeah. reading that, then I'm going to read the Grimes. That way I have some some awareness of what they yeah. were physically doing in their industry as, mm -hmm. and then go into this spiritual interpretation that Grimes uh, uh, asserts in her doctoral dissertation, Becoming Gold, okay. which people can get in Canada through Anathema Publishing. Shout out to Canada. Canada's yeah. own Anathema Publishing. Go get it there. Yeah, yeah support Anathema. <laughs> and also uh, your book, Ophanic Revelation, that you uh, helped Vincent a bit with. So it's mostly his work, as you said. That oh, that's his work. I it's, it had an introduction. In fact, we got into an argument about that because if you read the introduction to that, we got into arguments a lot. We had a very dysfunctional, delightful friendship, and Alan and I both really miss him. He actually, he married the two of us, by the way. He introduced wow. us, he married us. Uh, but um, it was clear when I was working or hanging around him that he was a teacher and I was a student. And that was fine. I mean, I, it was like, what a steep learning curve of the occult. I mean, it, it was intense and wonderful for a few really precious years. But so we got to this and we're, and we're writing the introduction. And he was upset at my slow progress, which I understand. I, I do things. I did things more slowly than he did. But then we got to a certain point and he is going off on this whole thing about Crowley. And I'm like, look, I don't think this is an introduction to Enochian. We don't need like half of this to be Crowley. And he basically was like, well, it's going to be there. You're booted from the project. I'm like, well, okay then. I mean, so you can see in that introduction, there's a definite point where the style changes. That's because I wrote the first part and he wrote the second part. So anyway. The cultists uh, are such famously easygoing people. Yeah, we yeah we get along with everyone. We never argue. That was the only you know the only time. Yeah, um, amazing. Um. But uh, I, I actually we had a point in around 2010 or 2011 um, where I just thought I'm never going to talk to this person again, and he probably thought the same about me. I mean, my dear husband was like the color of a white sheet of paper once after after one of our disagreements about. Uh, something that we were working on i actually have gotten a lot more mild mannered i'm sort of ashamed to look back at those at, the, at those days in a certain way but um anyway um we were i i was never going to talk to him again and he was like never going to talk to me again and it's it's not, sort of like kids on a playground going like me and you're not my friend anymore yeah and so I am really glad that that didn't last and we got back in contact and we're on good terms before he unexpectedly died. I mean, I'm really grateful for that. Since we have touched so much on him and you've shared these like beautiful little memories of, of this fellow who I think the occult world due to the, 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 he only put out this book and his book on Kelly, as far as I know. And I haven't, yeah. and I've been trying to get his Kelly book for a couple of years actually, because I heard about his book on Kelly before I heard about you. Um, uh -huh and couldn't get it and that's why i ended up doing a, i tried to promote him in a way uh vincent bridges by by okay. doing a commentary on uh, some of the stuff from the the pamphlet i got in prague at the alchemist museum yeah there's a little mm -hmm. piece of his writing in there i'm like yeah. how come no i can't find anything out out about this guy hardly at all it seems um his books are hard to get um this one i just didn't i just didn't know what it was and the cover made me mm -hmm. think it was a bit too new agey for me but turns out it's it's wild and delightful and has the best exploration of the letters that i've ever seen and i thought maybe we could just quickly talk about uh, one aspect of the book mm -hmm. which is his study yeah. of the enochian letters and could you maybe just illuminate a, give us a bit of a, a an incentive for those who will buy this book about what they're going to learn about his theories of the letters and what they are sure well he a couple things now the look 
that there is an article by his former partner Darlene on the letters that's that's excellent also that's looking at him as waveguides. So I think that's maybe the part that you opened up I'm yeah. there. I'm not sure. Well, I'm, but I'm then his whole calling yeah. the whole book his essentially. Yeah. God. Well and and who knows? I mean, I think a lot of the ideas well, you know what, I'm not even gonna say that because I uh a lot of the articles that were in there um, are from the Journal of the Western Mystery Tradition, and he revised them in there um, from the Journal of the Western Mystery Tradition and added to them. But the center part of it was the the biggest Enochian working that I know of in my lifetime. And I, I wasn't there, but I know quite a few people who were there. And so that's the complete Enochian handbook. So in that, and I'll get to the letters, okay, but in that, what he's doing is looking at each component of the Enochian system as in terms of what geometric shape it is. And these are all shapes that rotate. Now that came, I think, I'm certain uh, he talked about it as a, a visionary experience of, of, of interacting and seeing those shapes. But then with the letters at a certain point, um, you know, you're working with this system and you think, why am I working with this system? In other words, Enochian is not the best system for doing a usual magical thing like, I don't know, working your will over someone or that kind of thing. It is, we it, you, you start to feel, or at least we have, that it's helping you evolve and stay healthy. I know this goes counter to common belief, but this this is our experience. So he, had, he uh, wrote a thing called Angels in the DNA, which is, um, actually it's my favorite article of his where he looked at how you could arrange the letters and the weird way that they map and how they could map to transfer RNA. I'm not sure if that's the one you're talking about, but that's the one that is my favorite. And it, it looks at a, it draws on a, uh, a couple of articles that looked at the I Ching that way, actually, like if you're going to, have these trigrams and these trigrams and put them together you could shuffle these in the same way that dna shuffles itself that's that's a very very general idea but you know how do you prove such a thing it's like you can't i remember when he was trying to cite that and he asked me to because this we were past our bit of me sending him sending him you know people ranting about his citation style on freshman comp sites we were in a good place then and he was like, could you find a way to cite this? And I'm like, well, you've cited it. And he was like, well, yeah, but this just sounds like from the angels to me or something. And I was like, well, that's basically what it is, isn't it? Because it was. It was just a kind of unprovable download, but it's kind of awesome. Anyway, that's yeah. the one I thought you were talking about. If you're talking about the one about them as waveforms. Um, I've looked at that, both of them, yeah. 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 Um, that the one about the letters as waveforms grew out of the one he wrote. And then I think, um, I remember when Darlene was writing that one and she was writing it, it was something he'd always talked about a lot, but she was a, was a, a photographer. And so she really did a, a beautiful articulation of it. But that's about all I'd. Yeah. Uh, so by that, you know, it seems to me that the difficulty people have with Enochian can be explained by a series of things that are, are fairly simple. First of all, not doing it in a Tiferetic space, not doing it for sort of personal spiritual alchemy, but trying to, to work one's will with it, and then having tablets that are mislettered, because we never have any of those problems. Did Kelly read? The Monus Hieroglyphica. I tried to ask this on the Enochian group that oh. um, that that I've gotten so much help from in the past, yeah. and I oh yeah. Maria Maria Montgomery, Maria Montgomery an apology yeah. because early on I said that I didn't see the Monus having any impact in my relationship to Enochian magic or pursuit of the great work at all, and she said, "Well, for me, it definitely does." I'm like, "Well, I'm open to that. I'm open to hearing why it would have that, but it just hasn't based on my understanding of it." And thank you for bringing that understanding now to me. And so sorry, oh. Maria, for not 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 copying on sooner but i'm now my eyes are open and the things have fallen the scales have fallen from them and uh i can't imagine enochian magic or d or the golden dawn without the monus hieroglyphica now well, which is but, such a crazy revolution in my thinking that it's it's, it makes me giddy every time i contemplate it that's well look there's 
there is a reason for that. Like the, the most basic connection between the two is obscured by translation. And that's like elementata, which yeah. would be like air of air or air of earth or, you know, air of fire. I mean, a, an element and a sub element, that word was constantly mistranslated in just as element. So how would you see that he's breaking things up in the Monus Hieroglyphica using the same kind of system that then shows up in Enochian? I mean, there was no translation available. And so that was, um, you know, in with me, I would say, well, thank, thanks to uh, thanks to those scholars who were writing about medieval text using the word elementata, who figured out that that's what it was. But, yeah, you know. yeah, scholarship um, is always a team effort, really, if you do it right, as you as you pointed out. How, but you know, did, did, yeah, go ahead. No, did Kelly was did he explain the monist to Kelly? Because well, there's there, things I mean, Kelly brings through that seems like he understood the monist. And if he didn't, well, that's a coincidence, isn't it? Um, I'm just yeah. curious. It's just a sick curiosity. I just want to know. So I think I think that Kelly had to be way smarter than people give him credit for, first of all. And and just to, you know, when people talk about whether or not this could be faked and they say it couldn't be faked, well, then add to that. Or if anyone did fake it, they're just such a genius and so literarily skilled. I I, I want to know them anyway. So I think I, I can't imagine that Kelly didn't understand it. For one thing, I'm sure it was used in espionage. You could use it to make great uh, um clock cy ciphers and you know i mentioned when i was in this voynich group working with glenn claston or tim rayhill he that's that's what he saw the whole thing is doing well if they're there as intelligencers and there is something they're using that for well yeah but then on top of that the most embarrassing mistake i have made in my history as a uh, writing about john d was when i started out i was sure that the tuba veneris was by John D. And the reason I was sure was because it connected to his life so clearly in ways that someone wouldn't really know. And I, I, um, through my Hubert, I insisted John D did it. Well, I don't, I don't, I think I was wrong. Uh, and I hope I have the opportunity to have our revised translation republished and, and say I was wrong. I don't think that it was by D. But as the German translator points out, and I'm trying to think of his name and blocking it, but he says, this is a, this is a, a forgery, but it's a really weird forgery. Um, and this will, I, I promise, this will connect to the hieroglyphic mode in oh. just a sec. Um, he, he's like, this is a forgery. And he said it was probably written in a German speaking country between, I think, like 15, eight, sometime in the 1580s, basically when Dee and Kelly were there. And it by somebody who knew intimate details of Dee's life. Well, the other thing that that translator, uh, George Meyer, maybe anyway, that he that uh, that he didn't say, I noticed when Nancy Turner and I were working on it. And that was, gosh, whoever did this really knew the hieroglyphic monad. Well, since the person there who most likely knew intimate details of Dee's life and we know that Kelly got a lot of mileage out of being Dee's sidekick. And Jennifer Rampling talks about that in her scholarship that like Dee's, ha Dee has Ripley's bosom uh, book, which is George Ripley's kind of secret alchemical text. Dee goes back to England and every place that Kelly is doing alchemy, all of a sudden there's all of the bosom book. I even think, and I, I argued uh, that in my class, that people like Heinrich Kuhnrath, who associate the monad with physical alchemy, that the reason is Kelly and Kelly's success with physical alchemy. So if, for example, it was Kelly that did the tuba veneris, that person, whoever wrote it, whoever did that forgery, knew the hieroglyphic monad. And to me, that's sort of the best evidence that Kelly understood it. Not to mention the best explanation I ever got it, uh, for it until I started diving in myself was from Vincent, who claimed to have the memories of Kelly. And he hasn't been, there were things he said about it that I just totally ignored. And then um, looked at more than 10 years later, and I was like, holy crap, he was right. I mean, he, he, he could be a, a very frustrating individual on the one hand. On the other hand, you know, if you're right a lot of the time and you don't know why you're right and people always are telling you you're wrong, I mean, I think you kind of get an attitude. So, I mean, I understand the attitude that, that he had. 
Anyway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the the and that the video on the turba was really good. I I did all the word study videos as well, all the offshoot things, the oh, Zozomos three vid, everything. Of course, so of course, I had to. You are appreciated. The, it seems almost impossible to me that that like D couldn't have been teaching about the Monas as he went around Europe. This is going back to the mm -hmm. Yates Francis yeah. Yates thesis on setting up Rosicrucianism by communicating his ideas to people as he traveled around. And why wouldn't he do that? It seems why wouldn't he do that is a hard question to answer. Um, of yeah. course he would do that. The fama fraternitatis and the confessio and the chemical wedding with the the Monus hieroglyphica right on the front of it. And people have been oh. saying my whole life that there's no connection between John D and the Rosicrucian tradition. That's just- I just think that that's got to be thrown out, you know, and, and I don't know how Yates figured that out, but I think she was just dead on. I mean, the philosophy behind the Monet is the, is proto-Rosicrucianism. And, and it, it gets condensed in in all kinds of ways, but and, you know, and then there's also in the fama. And by the way, this isn't my idea. I want to shout out to my friend uh, Jeffrey Kupperman because he noticed this. And then I was yeah. like, oh wow, I agree with you. You know, in the fama, it's re it's referring to this strange language. Well, maybe that's Enochian. I mean, the question I have about the later Rosicrucian stuff is not um, does why the effect. More, why isn't there Enochian in it? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's Until the question I have the, about it. The only thing that looks like it to me, like it can be related, is that that part in the fama. And then it doesn't show up until like the ciphers, right? Right. The cipher manuscripts. And then you are have to figure like, well, Alan Thurgood found in the British Library some people in the 1700s who were using it, but they didn't seem to be using it to great effect, really, or anything like that. And um, you know, there's all Dr. Rudd, um, and then there are people like I think it's Peter Smart who's a copyist. And, yeah. I mean, you can you can really kind of crank, it, but but that's different from thinking. Okay, this is this is what these are people doing are doing to set this up. So how does it show up then? I mean, I know there's Hockley, and Hockley is copying things. Um, but uh, I think there there's there's still some big gaps that that we haven't found. In other words, like I basically accept the account with the cipher manuscript and how it winds up in there that Hockley is the source of Enoki, and he has to be. I mean, I don't see anyone else. But then, all right, where is Hockley getting it from? One thing that's occurred to me is we you know people tend to believe that Eliphas Levi did had no interest in it and thought it was evil, and I I sort of have difficulty believing that, but. Could, I, yeah, I hear a lot of different things about good old LFL Levy, and uh, okay. I do hope to read his uh, the Churton's biography on him one day because I would like. I've heard that he never practiced magic. I've heard that he pioneered all of Golden Dawn magic and wrote the LBRP, which definitely isn't yeah. true. Um, but I've heard many things like like we all have, and it's very hard to tell with with him and that period yeah. that that produced Elephas Levy. Um, coming from the Elizabethan period up through the 1600s uh, birth of Rosicrucianism into like, yeah, Memphis, Mizraim, Masonry, and all these other different forms of the heyday of the early Masonry, as well mm -hmm. as this popular time for alchemy and where mm -hmm. we know they were using substances and stuff. And here's the question. I, I, I When it comes to that, that the development of Enochian Rosicrucianism and all of those streams into the Victorian ma magical eras and, and associated systems, I think of the fact that if they if they weren't using um, uh, DMT, then where was DMT in history, right? Like um, the argument against cannabis in the biblical times, even though they grew fields of it, was that there's no word for it. And of course, we're like, well, what about cannabosum? Can't cannabosum have referred to cannabis? Like, no, it referred to this other thing. It's like, so they had no word to refer to the thing they grew fields of. Right. Mm -hmm. If it's not that word, then you're saying they had no word for it. And that's what my Hebrew professor and Bible teachers taught us in at UBC, yeah. um, that, huh. that that was in reference to cannabis. But it really does oh. look like it must be. So if, if DMT doesn't show up at all in history ever until now, which isn't doesn't make any sense, 
then where is it? And we do see it in the Masonic rites. We do see it in Cagliostrin and perhaps being made by Kelly and D. And if that was what it was, it would it would definitely lead to the kind of secrecy as well as mind blowing experiences that they people like that were having. And I could see why they'd want to keep it as a very secret as the Philosopher's Stone, the secret of the philosophers to only show yeah, to the I candidates that would be the only argument i could come up with again it's not a hill i'm willing to die on and if there's yeah, none of, if yeah. none of that stuff is what it was a part of the western esoteric tradition i would be fine with that i just i i just don't know enough about it yeah uh, and the the you know that's all i all i can say about it. now vincent had a theory about rudolph uh you know the holy roman emperor rudolph the second i heard of him who, yeah. who nice night guy. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, he had uh, kind of a drinking problem and kind of went downhill when Kelly was in prison. And so I started looking at that, too, because I was fast, like, what happens to Rudolph here? And and we had different theories. And then, I mean, we were in Prague, so it was kind of nice. Like you and, and this was right after also that a Czech scholar found um, information in Germany about Kelly basically saying that his knighthood was not exactly granted by Rudolf, but that it was an Irish knighthood and there were letters from England saying that he's he's Sir Edward Kelly now, which which really changed Kelly's scholarship. Hmm. But so so one of the, the theories floating around there was that when Kelly was free, he was making some kind of concoction that was keeping Rudolf, you know, OK. And then with Kelly in prison and Rosenberg dead or perhaps poisoned, which is another theory because he dies at a real inopportune time, that um, that whatever Rudolph's medicine was that Kelly was making, he didn't get. And so he goes downhill. Who knows? I mean, I maybe like that. some, that's a know? fun story. Did Kelly's family really poison him in prison? I don't. I, do, I think someone did. I don't know why his uh, that. So. So in Vincent's book on Kelly, he wrote a short story about what he thought, which was that um, that it was like Kelly's family, but under duress of like, you do this or else. And yeah, he was right. going, he'd already broken a leg anyway. And so maybe there was some kind of, of complicity there. But uh, the, that last chapter of Kelly's life, Vincent wrote as a, a short story about how he thinks that Kelly died, which mm. is basically that that his wife poisoned him. Wow. Um, well, I, I, have, has... I, I honestly have no opinion on that. I really don't. Given the things he said about his wife, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> that guy did not like that woman. <laughs> they must have been. Well, if I mean, my theory about him is right. What? He married her for money and unfortunately not very much. Like two hundred. Well, pounds. that's 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 the story. But what if he was told, like, you're gonna marry this person because she's the parent of these two kids that this noble dude knocked up, and so you're gonna leave and and go with D. And for that matter, I mean, it's um. Yeah. But that's you know that's part of the thing I'm exploring in my like National Enquirer history of D and Kelly and their families. I mean, I love it. The whole. Yeah, the whole relationship between between D and his wife is odd too. It's just not as odd, and they do seem to at least like each other. So I hope that everyone <laughs> who's everyone everyone studying Enochian magic, even half as seriously as as we are before in in this era, puts out a novel about them before they die. We just could use a whole bunch <laughs> of them. I think just get all the ideas out there. Get even the crazy ones out there. Maybe especially the crazy ones. Yeah. Uh, so many things can be found by these wild ideas. I mean, the idea that not only is the Monus Hieroglyphica outlining a system of spiritual initiation and spiritual alchemy, explicitly spiritual alchemy, going yeah. from Zosimus through the Codex Marcianus direct, directly to D and oh. then directly from D through Rosicrucian and the Golden Dawn, and outlining those elemental progressions in the sequence the Golden Dawn uses. That, that seemed to me unbelievable. Well, like, and I don't that's just what I think, you know, the, the sort of verdict of the elders of the Golden Dawn is 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 out on that. I I, I don't. But I think when sure they realize is, what sure you've done, they're going to be very interested. 
<laughs> well, it, I mean, it is odd, though, like, right, we have now you realize we're in Malkuth of Isaiah and there is the first four grades that sure seems similar. And we have four elements. It sure seems similar, although there's a, a certain sleight of hand then that happens like with the thing, the, the grades that would be associated with Netzach and Hod. It's hard to attribute, but then those both become M. I mean, this is way later on in the monad, yeah, so I'm sorry. But, but they're in Malkut anyway. But, yeah, right, right. And there's all these. The, the, so I can't see it any other way, but, you know, maybe someone else can. He's definitely, there is no question he's outlining a, a, the path of the initiate. I mean, there is, to me, absolutely no question of that. But um, if it's. But then that also means someone understood it. And my vote for that as, you know, someone who is, is I'm only an, a, an elder in age, I am no elder of any magical order, um, is that, I mean, lately it's become all right with people to just bash Mathers. I mean, oh. I, 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 like, I like Nick Farrell a lot. I did not like his book on Mathers. Oh. Um, I enjoyed and, it, even though I like Mathers. Uh, I still, yeah. I, well, the, you know, we have so little of this stuff in our sphere yeah. of study. It's we'll take we, what we can get, even if it's we, a, a bit wild. But it, but Mathers and Westcott together, and they weren't the only ones. I mean, if they un understood the monad as well as you do now, for example, couldn't you easily make that attribution? Regardless of if that's what D intended, and I think D is, he's, he says, in effect, he's making two grades, and one of them has four subgrades. So it's, if you... it's so crazy. I really do think that this is going to revolutionize the Golden Dawn world, um, but maybe not. Maybe it'll stay too stodgy. Um, but I think that people will love this. I think, uh, like, uh, uh, in, in the introduction to the portal papers put out by uh, the ever reliable Hellfire press um tony fuller uh mentions yeah. how quickly the grade material was actually produced um and how much of it was produced yeah and how impossible it would be for one person mathers being the main one during mm -hmm. this key window um that mm -hmm. dr fuller discusses um yeah and right. put out all it's it's too much for one person to put out in a year and a half or two or three years well, there, and it no was way. almost and... all there from the very beginning of the order onward and yet we see things that were done habitually in the order for example like using a sign of the entrance sign of silence in certain rituals mm -hmm. that aren't there in the manuscripts in the earliest form or even in the later forms from the new zealand temper temple so it just points to how much oral tradition and oral teaching there still was especially in the golden dawn people like to think it's all in regard or something and we're slowly changing that understanding it's depressing yeah. to think that the majority of the information is unpublished and and even worse yeah. lost to oral tradition perhaps a lot of well, it which i don't think it so if you if you now i i am not going to presume to remember all the knowledge lectures but let me just like take some stabs at things some of the things that d is assuming that you know if you go through the monas hieroglyphic it is clearly you know the hebrew alphabet you know the hebrew for the sephiroth you know the the four worlds you know the zodiacal signs and you know how to divide them into elements and you know the triplicities, you know alchemical symbols, you know things. I mean, after a while, it's like you're reading it. You're, it's, it's like you're assuming, okay, maybe no one is going to read this, the, all of these works and know these associations anymore, so we'll turn them into a knowledge lecture. Here, you need to learn the letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and you need to learn these words about them, and then you need to learn all the spheres of Isaiah, and I mean, it, it's, if nothing else, wherever that material came from, people, there, there was certainly an assumption that maybe people didn't know as much as they used to know anymore. And that's like, what, in the 1890s? So I see that. And that critique, I find, actually cuts both ways a lot of the time. Um, you yeah. know, it's like, it's, it's sort of always true. It's like they didn't know. Like, yeah, you wouldn't want to know, be as limited as a Victorian. Uh, no. Uh, academic was but you also wouldn't mind knowing a lot of the stuff that they know 
because yeah. a lot of it's just not taught anymore. Again, we didn't grow up with Greek and Latin. Well, I had some Latin in Waller school, but not enough um, to make much of an impression. It's just like a little exposure, but like, well, you know. And if, if, I, if I could do one thing again in my life, it would be to learn ancient Greek. I really, I've tried and I think now I'm too old, really. I honestly, do, because what a language of like the perfect language at it Greek for philosophical discourse. I mean, just shades of meaning. They, they don't exist in English, but they didn't exist in Latin. I mean, they it's it's such a beautiful language and it's not like modern Greek either. I mean, which is not to diss modern Greek, which I also don't speak. But I, I mean, I wish I could could uh, learn ancient Greek. You know, I recently was going to take a Koine class at, at my old uh, grad school here on on uh, that or classical Greek. And I, I had a long chat with Dr. Sasha Chato, who did the mm -hmm. Peladan book. Um, Joseph N. Peladen, and she actually told me, "Don't do that." And she's a, really? a she lives in Greece and speaks it fluently. And I was like, "Really? Yeah, that's what I said." Really? And she's like, "Go take a modern Greek course. The language hasn't died. It's doing fine. Start with modern Greek. You'll learn it all eventually. Like you know, just go from okay. there." And I was like, "Well, that would be way more fun because I love Greek food." Then you can speak it. Yeah. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah um, it, which is. I wouldn't give that advice to someone with Hebrew be just from my understanding of how Hebrew has changed from biblical to modern. I mean, right. in modern Hebrew, you have tense. We don't <laughs> have that in biblical Hebrew. There's no tense. And of course, yeah. everyone's like, well, how do you know when it's a prophecy or not? It's like, exactly. exactly. That's, yeah. Think about that. <laughs> you got a conversive vav. That's it. If there's a conversive vav, you know, it's probably past tense, but not always. Just well, for it, fun. It, it, well, and then the whole bit with, with vowels is like it makes... You have a way of thinking that has been lost. And that's one of the things I realized working on this translation. I mean, it was being lost by the Renaissance, but you can kind of tease it out. It's like, so with it is the assumption that everything sacred has this multiplicity of meanings. And it's always, there's a, this constant unveiling, which is, I don't know, kind of awesome. And yeah, and, and the way you demonstrated that, the the later Rosicrucians solving a mystery in the Monas Hieroglyphica with with vitriol was was amazing and everyone in the GD tradition will hear me say that and be like no way and go watch the course yeah, no, fellas no. ladies yeah. everyone well, that, that's in the, and that comes from Agnes Klein that was her discovery I would Agnes Klein if you're alive and listen to this please call me find oh. me yeah well we definitely I mean, we, we need to get together some uh, some sort of more D conferences or things in the near future hey that would be that fun. Would, um, well, listen, clearly I, lots to I, I, study it, and Peterson's got a new version of this coming out this year in August, I no, believe. I didn't know that. I yeah, it's like a hundred and ten dollars on my Amazon uh, thing page. Oh, I okay. noticed it, okay. and I'm clearly I he's adding that. the new information from. I'm hoping and assuming he's adding the information from De Compendia, a De, De Heptarchia Mystica yeah. the manuscript, then the Compendia mm -hmm. and the Lexic. The, the new one, the one that, yeah. from 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 Ashmole, seventeen ninety. That's yeah, really. Yeah, I want to I want to uh, um, find out uh, more about Ashmole, seventeen ninety. But um, yeah, uh, you were uh, somewhat. We were talking about uh, Athanasius Kircher and if he was a secret magician. Was I don't crypto think, magician. Well, I, think right. I think he. I think he was hostile to magic. Yeah, I, I think, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah. I, I just thought. I, mean, I, I just thought you might know something I didn't know. No, no, I don't. I mean, I know expert on Athanasius Kircher, okay? I'm not, but, and yeah. I admit I have a little chip on my shoulder about him because it's like people like Heinrich Kuhnrath, like they're attributing, they're, they're saying John D says this in his letter to Maximilian, or they're using the monad symbol, and Kircher just rips things off whole cloth. I mean, it really, after a while, it just gets infuriating. And I know the time was different and I know plagiarism was not a thing then and all of that, but but whole swaths of the hieroglyphic monad, they're just in Oedipus Aegypticus, including like all the measurements in theorem 23, but not only that, the only nice thing about reading it for me was that was where I was going through and I'm like, why is he talking about the Timaeus all the time with this thing that looks like the monad? And then I was like, oh my gosh, I missed a huge context and went back and 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 studied the Timaeus for a while and and I'm lucky that I was at that time in a department that included philosophy and I bothered my friends there constantly about the Timaeus you know and so I mean that was nice but then he also tries to 
he's he's a, a piece of work and i think yeah, now we was. should stop <laughs> sorry but, no um, that's okay i mean he ripped off johannes reuchlin as well and yeah yeah and, and, oh yeah and, and and i would say there's nothing necessarily wrong with that per se especially in that time period but in my opinion gauging knowing what i know about the history of theology and religious orders mm -hmm. I like and look at the way he diagrammed the angels around the name of of, of Jesus, right? And and Damien Eccles turned that into a wonderful full on ritual where you invoke all the angels in the same layout that yeah. that that, yeah. that, um, that, that Kierkegaard had. I forgot about them. that. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So wow. the reason and he he gives the four letter names of every culture that represent God, but he ch any time he ran into a culture that had more or less than four letters, he just changed it. And the whole purpose yeah. of the diagram was to show that Jesus is overall. You know, this it, it was yeah. a Jesuit, you know, Christos Uberalis kind of argument, and and he wasn't favorable to magicians. And also, it's ironic as hell that magicians like Damien Eccles are turn turning yeah. his diagrams into ritual <laughs> of massive evocation. I. I <laughs> I love I that that's... idea, actually. It sort of, it says, <laughs> but then we'll get back into the thing. The thing is, even Roikland, like Roikland, you know, who, at least who many of his sources of Kabbalah are. So like, yeah, he's appropriating and we can say whatever you want about appropriate, but you know where he got it from. I mean, and that's how you can trace a lineage where Kircher is just like mine. This is mine. Look, it's mine. Anyway, that's my opinion of Kircher since you 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 mentioned it before. Yeah, I, I got a I got a bone to pick with Kircher, but at the same because he's so you know uh, Christo totalitarian, but at the same time it, he's kind of wonderful because of all the beautiful work he yeah. did, and, and you know I mean yeah. humans aren't simple, so that's what a great that's what a great little uh, quirky note to end on with uh, <laughs> the the later the Jesuit uh, you, uh, appropriation of John D and Christian Cabal and all these things to you know, for their, their agenda. Yeah. I well, think call it. He's, I tell you, and I should like him anyway. He's an, he's an awesome source for trying to figure out the monad because. Well, you wouldn't have, so you wouldn't have even looked at Timaeus in your translation. If it I weren't. Think I, I don't know. I think I would have gotten to it eventually, but I mean, cause this is like 2007 that I was going through Kircher and all of this. Um, and I mean, I think I would have gotten to it eventually, but it by the time I'm here is this glyph of of the monads. Here is his explanation of things, just like in the hieroglyphic monad. But he's referring all over the place to Timaeus. It it sure supercharged the process. I mean, before then, I just thought since that that whole sun symbol is also a symbol of the Pythagorean monad, and since he's doing all this stuff that are clear references to Plato's Republic in the letter, I was like, and D is well known as a Neoplatonist. I was looking at it that way but it hadn't occurred to me like all the the way that he's overlapping the the receptacle and bina and things like that no i i mean i hope i would have run into it eventually without without his help <laughs> man there's so much uh i i i hope that we can do this again sometime yeah, I've got, uh, your, you book, your book will be arriving uh at some point with me i've got it uh ordered and Whoa. And then I'll go through the whole course again, and and really, this time I just absorbed. I was like, okay, I know I'm going to hear this in uh, this 50 hour video course multiple times in my life. So how how do I want to approach? And I thought about it, and I just was like, I'm just going to absorb. And uh, the exercises were good, though. Uh, you know, if you know the knowledge lectures well, unfortunately, they're um, less challenging. Uh, if you, uh, there's some good challenges though in in those in, in mysteries left to uncover. There's mysteries left to uncover. Well, I just appreciate you you watching along. I, I'm I'm very sincere about that, and really kind of psyched to discover your stuff, which I had not looked at until until this course, and we got in contact with each other. And I'm I, so I hope we can get together and do Enochian sometime. I sort of have a sense we will before this, as they say, this dance is through.